All right, so we've seen a couple of quantum mechanical problems so far, the, the free particle and the 1D particle in a box. Now let's consider a third problem, which turns out to be very similar to the particle in a box, uh, but with some important differences. So uh, that's going to be called particle on a ring for reasons that will become clear shortly, but mainly so that we can highlight the differences between the particle in a box and the particle on a ring. Let me just summarize a few things we know about the particle in a box. Namely, that if we take a particle and confine it to a one-dimensional box between 0 and A on some axis, then uh, the particle has some wave function. There's a lot of different wave functions I could have drawn. Each of those wave functions has to hit 0 at the edges of the box. Those wave functions had a particular mathematical form, and they have a particular energy. And again, each one of those different wave functions, n equals 1 or 2 or 3, has a different wave function, has a different energy. So that's, that's what we know about the particle in a box. Now let's consider a different problem. Let's consider still confining our particle to a one-dimensional line, but now let's take that line and let's bend it. Let's bend that line around all the way until it forms a circle. So I could say still length A, but now that length is the circumference of a circle. So if I want to describe where the particle is, instead of describing where it is along the x-axis, I'll just describe at what angle I find it. So this circle has some radius r, and I can use theta to describe the angle to describe where I am around that circle. I'm still going to have a wave function. I'm going to have a wave function that depends on the coordinates of the particle. Now, because the particle can be anywhere in, in the plane of the board, it feels like a two-dimensional problem. But because if, if I'm confining the particle to live on the, cir the circumference of the circle, r has to be constant. So the only variable that's allowed to change is theta. So it's still a one-dimensional problem, but now I'm describing where the, the uh, wave function is as a, a value of the wave function as a function of theta rather than as a function of x. So that's one of the first uh, differences between this problem and the particle in a box problem. We can see now why it's called particle on a ring. Particles confined to this ring. We could have called it particle on a circle, or if uh, we've got this string that we've now wrapped around into a circle, we could call it particle on a, on a rope. There's a lot of different names you could give to this particle. We'll call it particle on a ring. Some people call it particle in a ring. So we're going to have a wave function that depends on theta. Uh, the boundary conditions, the thing that for a particle in a box required the wave function hit 0 at the edges of the box, that's no longer required. The, the wave function doesn't have to hit 0 at the edge because there is no edge of this box. If I have a wave function that starts somewhere and oscillates as it goes around the circle, let's see. All I need is that when I get back to where I started, notice I made these two curves join up. So really what I need to have my boundary condition is that when I get back after one full lap, back to where I started plus one full revolution of the circle, that needs to have the same value as when I started. Otherwise, if I came back and missed, if I came back at a different value than when I started, I wouldn't have just a single uh, function. I need it to have the same value on every trip around this loop. So that's the boundary condition that's going to replace the zero at the edges boundary condition for particle in a box. So that's another difference between this problem and the particle in a box problem. If, and I'm not going to go through the solution in detail, I'll skim through the details of this particle on a, in a ring problem because we've already seen something very much like it in particle in a box. But if we solve this problem, we still need to write down the Schrodinger equation. I'll write that down for us, and then I'll explain the differences between it and the one for particle in a box. So this looks a lot like the particle in a box, 1D particle in a box Schrodinger equation. In that problem, our second derivative was d squared dx squared.
here the variable we're interested in is theta. I don't just take d squared d theta squared, I take 1 over r squared d squared d theta squared. You can take my word for it that that's what the um, uh, Schrodinger equation of the Laplacian looks like uh, for this problem, or if you want to double check me, what this is is if you take for this two-dimensional problem, if I write down d squared dx squared plus d squared dy squared because I have two different dimensions, if I convert those x's and y's to polar coordinates and then I require r to be constant, what survives is just 1 over r squared d squared d theta squared. If that sounds like fun, uh, pause the video and do that little exercise right now. If that doesn't sound like fun, like I said, you can just take my word for it. That's uh, the Schrodinger equation for the particle on a ring problem. So again, it basically boils down to the same problem. Just like particle in a box, we're going to be looking for some function that if I take the second derivative of it, I'm going to get back the same function, but with some constants and a negative sign. So um, like before, Function, a function whose second derivative is the negative of itself is trigonometric functions like sine. So sine of uh, some constant time theta is still going to be a good solution. Unlike the previous case, cosine also works. Cosine didn't work before because we needed something that would start at 0. Right? The, the wave function had to be 0 at the edges of the box. Sine is 0 at x equals 0. Cosine is not. So sine was a good solution for particle in a box. Cosine is also a good solution for, for the particle in a ring. If you're not too terrified by complex numbers, we can also use e to the i times a constant times theta. That will also solve this equation perfectly well. If you don't like complex numbers, we can put off thinking about complex numbers until a little bit later in the course. And you can pretend I never wrote that down. For the moment, let's just stick with constant times cosine, constant times theta. The next step would be figuring out what that value of k needs to be in order for this to be true. So whether you're thinking about it graphically or visually, what does that k have to be so that after I complete a full loop, I get back to where I started? Or whether you think about it mathematically and think about how to obey this boundary condition, we can convince ourselves Cosine of any integer times theta. So cosine of theta, cosine of 2 theta, cosine of 3 theta, or in fact, cosine of 0 theta, or cosine of negative 1 theta, or cosine of negative 2 theta, those are all fine. So any integer, cosine of an integer times theta, is a perfectly valid solution to this Schrodinger equation. And again, that just means the, the sine or the cosine needs to oscillate one full round trip as it goes around the circle. That would be cosine theta or two full oscillations as it goes around the circle, cosine of 2 theta, uh, or and so on. Or for, for 0, cosine of 0, then the wave function is just constant. It's, it remains constant without oscillating as it goes around the circle. So any of those solutions are perfectly good. The next step, so each of these different solutions with a different value of n is a different wave function that we can call psi sub n, just like we did for particle in a box. If I want to know what the energy of those solutions are so that I can compare them to the particle in a box solutions, we just need to plug these wave functions into the Schrodinger equation. So plugging into the Schrodinger equation, I can say minus h squared over 8 pi squared mass 1 over r squared. Second derivative of the function, second derivative of cosine is negative cosine, and I'll pull out an n twice. So I've got capital A, and I've got an n squared that's been pulled out, cosine n theta. That's on the left. On the right, I've got, that must be equal to E, energy, times the function, A times cosine n theta. Now this is just, um, I'm sorry, second derivative was negative a n squared cosine n theta. So that pulled out an extra negative sign. I've got an a and a cosine n theta that cancels on both sides. So what I'm left with is that the energy of this psi sub n wave function is equal to this collection of constants, which looks like h squared 
over 8 pi squared mass r squared and an n squared. So again, that's similar. This feels very similar to what we did for particle in a box. If I compare these directly, they're not the same. I no longer have a box length to worry about. Instead, I have um, an r squared in the denominator down here and a, and a pi squared that survives that didn't previously. And uh, but aside from that, the energies do depend on n squared, just like they did uh, before. All right, so, um, and I guess the last step would be if I want to know what the value of this normalization constant is, to normalize this function, since we've not done that too many times, normalizing the function requires that I take the wave function times itself, or its complex conjugate, and that has to equal 1 if I integrate everywhere. What that means for us is that if I integrate theta from 0 to 2 pi, I'm sorry, if I integrate over theta from 0 to 2 pi, the wave function squared is going to, look like, going to look like a squared cosine squared of n theta. If I care about what the, the normalization constant is, I would have to complete this integral uh, solve for a, and that tells me what the normalization constant is. It doesn't end up being square root of 2 over a, as it did for particle in a box. What we get, skipping the details of, of doing that integral, this integral turns out to be a squared times uh, pi, so a results in 1 over square root of pi. So that's the normalization constant. The last thing worth mentioning about this particle in a ring model is why we should care. Why did I say take this straight line and bend it around into a circle? What in the world would we ever use this particle in a ring model for? The answer is, is if particle in a box was a useful model for simulating uh, conjugated hydrocarbons that had the shape of a straight line. If I take one of those conjugated hydrocarbons and bend it around into a circle, then the particle on a ring model will be a good model uh, for those molecules. For example, a conjugated hydrocarbon bent into not a circle but a hexagon would be benzene. And there's a variety of other um, um, cyclical molecules that we could use as applications for this particular model. The reason it's worth talking about benzene as an example in particular, let's go back and look at what these energies are. If I draw a graph, a chart of the energies of these molecules, the n equals zero solution has an energy of zero times some constants. So the energy of the ground states down here there's two states, n equals 1, n equals minus 1, that have the same energy as each other. And then somewhere up higher, there's two more states, n equals 2, n equals negative 2, that have the same energy as each other. So some of our states are, are degenerate. There's two states with the same energy at this level and at this level, but the ground state is not degenerate. There's only one state. If I were to start filling these states with electrons, Notice that I fill up the first level after putting six electrons in. Not coincidentally, benzene has six pi electrons. So the six pi electrons in benzene occupy these lowest uh, uh, wave function energy levels that correspond at least approximately to these particle in a ring energy levels. So the reason benzene is a very stable aromatic compound is because it fills up uh, the ground and first excited state you may remember from an organic chemistry class, Huckel's rules about aromaticity specify that if you have 4n plus 2 electrons, a molecule will be aromatic. And that is a consequence of this um, particle on a ring model. Two electrons per energy level, 4n plus 2 electrons, is like 2n plus 1 energy levels. So if I fill uh, up to here, six electrons gives me an aromatic benzene molecule. If I fill one level higher, I would need 10 electrons to make the next aromatic ring size. So Huckel's rule about aromaticity is really an example of the particle on a ring uh, quantum mechanical model.